Born in Jamaica at a time when uh, I don't think we had even language for queer people, for um, lesbians. I mean, the only terms I had maybe available to me in terms of what other people used and certainly what I knew were derogatory terms, terms that, um, that, that made no one feel as if they wanted to identify with uh, that way of living, that way of, 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 of knowing oneself. Um, so I was a lesbian. And so brutal was the was the um, the violence against LGBT people. So resolute was homophobia in Jamaica that I don't think it dawned on me that I was gay until I was about maybe I think maybe 17 or 18, and then I didn't quite say it out loud until I was about 20. While you were in university, was that the place where you found that your words could be? Um, this catalyst for change and, and bringing awareness to social justice issues? I think my, my relationship to social justice began long before I knew it had begun. Uh, I think on campus, I was a loudmouth in every way. And certainly when I came to the place where I said, I'm a lesbian, I want to partner with women, I came out and said it loudly on campus. And in retrospect, I can see that that was a kind of activism in its own way. But I don't think it was intentful. So when I was attacked, 13 boys dragged me into a bathroom and sexually assaulted me. Uh, and I think I was not just undone by the thing itself happening, I was also un undone by the fact that I did not fight back and that I didn't respond in a way that was fierce and feminist and loud and unapologetic, that I was maybe quite still and silent during the process and um, then kind of went into a kind of hiding and quiet after it happened. And then I fled Jamaica and then I left Jamaica. And maybe, maybe it was then that I decided that I would never be silent again about something that was happening to me. I think I became an activist because I was so shocked and then furious and then undone by the fact that I could be on the campus of the University of the West Indies where I thought, you know, this was the, um, this was the acme of higher learning. You know, no one would use violence on this campus. We would always use words or disagreements or arguments would be intellectual. So I noticed that your work intersects a race, class, gender, and sexual orientation um, and sexuality. Were these ideas that had always been present in your work or did they develop over time? I think I, st I started out being, um, you know, you know, like how Trump says, America first, I'll say <laughs> lesbian first. <laughs> I think I started out lesbian first. Um, and then uh, I started to read the works of uh, June Jordan and Audre Lorde, and I started to read work that was maybe pushing me towards a more um, intersectional um, philosophy. Um, I think if you form connections with people, if your life expands, then it is natural that the people who you're concerned about, the issues you're concerned about, expands also. I kind of don't know how it is that I can be 44 years old and think I'm just fighting for lesbian rights or think I'm just fighting for the rights of immigrant Jamaicans without considering Mexican-Americans, without considering uh, Guatemalan-Americans, without considering Nigerian-Americans, without considering African-Americans. All oppression is connected. If you line up all the people who are against the black people and line up all the people who are against the gay people and line up all the people who are against poor women or against abortion and you put them all in the same corner, chances are they're related to each other, they know each other and so therefore it's the same enemy and therefore we need to link arms and figure out how it is to make all of these small movements and large movements too, these minority movements and these majority movements that are for the same thing to come together. We have to move towards progress. We cannot remove our struggle from the, from the person next to us. Fair and square means equal. That's good, fair and square. Because you always say, it's gotta be fair and square, and then we have to always talk about equality. They're the same thing. I found myself at 35, 36, 37, single, and wanting a kid, and watching 
literally like watching my ovaries dry up, hearing my eggs screaming, like, what are we doing? What are we doing? And I was watching the clock tick and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. But she's magical. She's gorgeous. She's fierce. She's keeps me on my toes. She reminds me I don't know everything, you know. <laughs> and I love the fact that I'm able to apologize to my five-year-old when I have done things that maybe weren't the best executed. That maybe that makes me feel like I'm different from the generation of people who raised me because she won't necessarily not have scars, but she will always know that wherever I wronged her, that I took responsibility for it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Such a pleasure talking with you. So for those of you who've just watched, uh, if you have any questions for us, please leave them below in the comment section. We do read them. We want to engage with you. So engage with us and be sure to check out more episodes by subscribing to our YouTube and following us at PBS on all social media. Mm -hmm.